it's your first or second time with us, we'd love to get to know you better. If you have a moment as you leave this morning, stop by one of our red bag tables on your way out. Fill out a Connect card and grab a free gift from us just to say thanks for joining us today. You can also fill out an online Connect card by scanning the QR code in your bulletin. We hope you're encouraged as we worship the Lord together. Don't forget equipping classes start this Wednesday. We will be launching numerous equipping classes to help you grow in your faith and also grow your community with others. You can learn more about these classes and sign up by visiting the tables outside the parlor or by going to harrisburgonline.org. Ladies, join us for our next Ladies' Night on February 7th at 6 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall. Michelle Thaden will be teaching on the topic of anxiety and what it looks like to be holding on to God's promises with peaceful soul in the midst of anxious thoughts. The cost is $10 and the meal will be catered by Chick-fil-A. Register by today online at harrisburgonline.org or by signing up at the table outside of the sanctuary. Preschool families, join us for pajamas and pancakes on Saturday, February 11th at 9 a.m. in the Fellowship Hall. This will be an intentional time for our preschool families to hang out, eat breakfast, and meet other preschool families. We will have a fun family activity as well as family photo opportunity. Don't forget to wear your pajamas. Register your family online at harrisburgonline.org slash events. We hope your kid will join us for an amazing trip to Camp at Crossings, Jonathan Creek this summer. This four-day camp adventure is an incredible opportunity for kids to grow in their friendships and faith in an amazing setting. HBC Kids Ministry is taking current third through sixth graders. Register online by February 23rd to save your spot. That wraps up our announcements for today. Again, welcome to Harrisburg. We hope you're encouraged in Christ today. Good morning good day to be in the house of the Lord. We're going to start today's service by reading Psalm 148. It says, praise the Lord, praise the Lord from the heavens, praise him in the heights, praise him all the angels, praise him all his hosts, praise him sun and moon, praise him all you shining stars, praise him you highest heavens and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord for he commanded and they were created and he established them forever and ever. He gave a decree, and it shall not pass away. Praise the Lord from the earth, you great sea creatures and all depths, fire and hail, snow and mist, stormy wind fulfilling his word, mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, beasts and all livestock, creeping things and flying birds, kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and all rulers of the earth, young men and maidens together, old men and children. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is, is exalted. His majesty is above earth and heaven. He has raised up a horn for his people. Praise for all his saints, for the people of Israel who are near to him. Praise the Lord. We have the uh, privilege of watching baptism this morning, so bring your attention to the baptistry. While Jason was reading that psalm, I couldn't help but think, if God never did anything else, everything in that scripture is true, but he is still working and he is still changing lives. And we get to celebrate that today with baptism. Everybody that's baptized in scripture does so on the other side of trusting in Christ. And so baptism is the way that we tell the world, I'm no longer who I once was. Jesus has saved me and he has changed me. I belong to him, I identify with him. And it tells the story of what Jesus did for us and what he then does in us for he was crucified buried raised after three days to new life and then when we trust in him our old man dies we die to ourselves. we trust in him we are forgiven we are made righteous in the eyes of the lord and we're given eternal life and all of that happens because of the power of jesus christ as the holy spirit works in us and so today this water doesn't change anyone's life but it does show the evidence of a life that has been changed and we're excited that we get to celebrate that with harper as she comes this morning to be baptized Harper, who do you profess as your Savior and Lord? Jesus Christ. And based on your profession of faith in Jesus, it's my privilege to baptize you as my sister in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let's stand together as we continue to worship. 
all creatures of our God and King. Let's lift our voices and let's sing in praise to him this morning. All creatures of our God and King, lift up your voice and with us sing. voices together on this last. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here the cross. 
Give him the praise. He is worthy. Would you turn to your neighbor and welcome him here to Harrisburg this morning? Please be seated. We have the opportunity now uh, to watch a video about a mission opportunity here at our church. Hello, Harrisburg. What a privilege you and I have to live where we do in Tupelo and in Lee County. And for all the people that are with us each Sunday as we worship, we have to realize that there are thousands upon thousands that are not in church at all. And so we want to do something a little different this year when it comes to spring break and how we do our missions. Beginning the week of March the 13th, we're going to have several opportunities for you to reach out local, to go local, if you will. Monday, March the 13th, join me here at the Lodge at 10 a.m. I'm asking you to join me so that we can disperse from here out to our community to meet and greet and invite our neighbors to our church for all the events we've got coming up that week and even up into Easter. Wednesday, March the 15th at 6 o'clock. Join all of your Harrisburg family right here at Tupelo Trace Apartments. We're going to have a block party. We're going to have our bouncy houses. We're going to have hot dogs. We're going to meet, greet, and just love on our neighbors and let them know there's a church right over here beside them that loves them and dearly wants to get to know them. March the 16th, join me here again in the lodge at 9 a.m. We're going to have a box folding party for an upcoming event we've got on March the 18th, Saturday morning. Join us Saturday, March the 18th, 7.30 a.m. out front of our building for once again, we're going to have a food distribution with our partners of the Mid-South Food Bank. You know, to be here, to fill up the boxes, to greet your neighbors, to invite them to church, and to have prayer with everyone that comes in our parking lot. We want to meet our neighbors. We want to serve our neighbors. We want to do everything we can to let Lee County and Tupelo know that there's a church here that loves them. And I'm asking you to join me each of these opportunities to do that very thing. Does that sound like a plan? Good. All right. Now, if... Good. If, if, if you're breathing and you love Jesus, there's something for you to do. And so right out back, there's a black screen. I just need to let you to let me know when you are available. Some of you will be traveling that week, I know, but you, if you're not here, you can at least pray for us that are here uh, and doing our part to reach our neighbors. So there's something for everyone. Uh, the one caveat, and I need to make this clear uh, for the food bank, uh, the, the rule for the Mid-South Food Bank, not us, is that you have to be 16 years and up. That's why we've included other things during the week that everybody can come be a part of. So with all that said, please make your way, not right now, after service, but uh, by Sunday school time, go, go back out to that black screen and let me know when you are going to be here 
and uh, we look forward to everything that God is going to do that week, okay? I'm going to pray us into the rest of this service, and I pray and hope that God is blessed by, by our efforts. Father, we do pray uh, once again uh, that you will uh, be in our midst, that we will be um, good visitors in your home, that we will sing uh, as to you, who the only one that is worthy, that uh, you will, as always, hide Pastor Rob behind the cross as he speaks to us, that we may hear, we may sing, we may think, uh, and we may leave this room different and better in you than when we were before we walked in. And for our efforts that we have got uh, on, the, on the schedule, we, we pray that you uh, will use us to spread the good news of Jesus to all who can hear it. And we pray this in his name. Amen. Family, church family, I want to introduce you to this guy here on my right. Uh, we've been searching and praying for almost a year uh, for a new worship associate. And uh, here he is. This is Luke Overton. Luke is a graduate of Blue Mountain College. And he's been leading worship in Tennessee at a church up there. Um, he's joining us here today. It's his first Sunday. His wife, Kate. Uh, their uh, almost two-year-old son, Jeremiah. And... A little baby girl, what, three weeks away? Three weeks away. Um, we've been searching and praying, like I said, um, for a long time for Luke. He's going to bring in such an incredible experience and incredible joy to our worship culture here. So would you give a warm Harrisburg welcome to Luke Overton, our new worship associate. Let's continue to worship. Cross 
all the praise and all the glory it's due to him. Please be seated. Now is the time for Treehouse. That's four-year-olds through third grade heading out those doors, and we'll see y'all after the service. It is good to have Luke joining us here on our team at Harrisburg, and uh, God continues to give us one of the best ministry teams, I think, in the country here, and uh, we are blessed uh, with our entire team and thankful for what Luke brings uh, here to our church and to our worship. I'm going to ask, if you would, just to make your way to the book of Ecclesiastes. Uh, if you're not sure where Ecclesiastes is, if you find the book of Psalms, you've almost made it. Just keep flipping to the right, uh, and it won't be too far uh, past there. So as we spend some time in our unfulfilled sermon series uh, today we look at work, uh, and in particular, who is more important than what when it comes to work. Uh, and so I hope uh, that that begins to make more sense and begins to maybe even land itself in your hearts uh, in terms of having a theology of work. Uh, maybe one of the most missing elements in the modern church is a right understanding of work and what it is and where it should fit and where it shouldn't fit in our lives uh, in, in a unique way here because of the country we live in, uh, the freedoms we have, the economy we have, and so that, that affords work uh, to have a place that may be hard to find in other countries. And so uh, we need to know how to think about work, and we have a lot of direction in Scripture, and in particular here in the book of Ecclesiastes for that. Well, I hear pages stopping, so let's pray together, and then we'll, we'll spend some time in the Word. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for today, uh, Lord, the opportunity to gather with your people, uh, to sing, or to celebrate, change lives, to hear from your word and pray now, God, that you would continue to transform us, that you would renew our minds, that your Holy Spirit would be at work, Lord, convicting us and challenging us and encouraging us and comforting us. And Lord, I pray this morning that we would have a better understanding of how to think about the place and the 
Relationships where we spend so much of our time here in our country at work. And so, Father, we pray that we would learn to to be Jesus-centered in all things and in all places. And we pray, Lord, that this morning's time in the Word would help us with that. And so, Father, we ask these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. So about 100 years ago, uh, as automation began to happen in the workplace, uh, we would look at it and see it as pretty crude. Uh, at this point, but you know, about 100 years ago, we began to send things pretty regularly down an assembly line. Uh, we began to have uh, the forerunners of what we have now with robots, and uh, some of our senior adults went over Wednesday to tour the Toyota uh, factory, and what I heard from many of them was so many robots and so big, uh, and how much of life over there is automated. And so uh, 100 years ago, you had people in our country predicting that we would move from a two-day weekend to a four to five day weekend in America, uh, that we would reach a point where we had such an automated process and there was so much happening at the touch of a button that our country would become so wealthy that we would basically spend our time on the weekend. And we would work a couple of days a week, maybe overseeing, correcting, and fixing. And even in the 50s and 60s, that thought still continued. This idea, if you watch the Jetsons, I've been talking to my children about the Jetsons, I don't know why. Uh, lately, but I, I feel older and older, and my children have no concept of the Jetsons. And so if you grew up watching the Jetsons cartoon and the fact that they would get on a little conveyor belt in their home, and they would walk, th- they'd ride on the conveyor belt, and it would do everything for them. They would get washed, they would get shaved, they would get dressed, and then as they came out, their robot, who was also the vacuum cleaner, would hand them breakfast, and then they would walk out and hop in their car, never touch anything on the car. They would just ride, and we're pretty close to that at this point. It's kind of scary, but they would get in their cars and just ride, and then the cars would just drop them at their workplace. And then they would sit down at a desk, and what would George Jetson do for work? He would press a button, and then he would lay back for the rest of the day. And the reason that we had that cartoon is because that was legitimately what people thought life could look like in this country in 50 years. Now, we don't have our flying cars. We, our robots are not maids. They're little bitty frisbee-looking things that ride around our houses and pick up the crumbs. We've come somewhat there, but we don't have a four- to five-day work week. But in the process of this, we have found ourselves maybe more consumed with work today than 100 years ago. In fact, we find a radically different relationship with work in our country than we did 100 years ago. You see, the moral, ethical, and religious landscape of our country has radically changed in the last 30 to 40 years. There's historic volatility in the marketplace, a rapidly changing religious landscape, and one of the changes is that instead of looking forward to a future where we would work less, most of us have shifted work from the outer layer of life to a central place where they find identity and community. In fact, over the last 20 to 25 years, we've had a time in which religion, in particular Christianity, has moved from the center of our country's life and even the center of many individuals' life, and now it's out on the outskirts. Christianity and religion are no longer driving the boat when it comes to the morals and the ethics of our country. You see, we've not been driving the moral boat for our country for many decades And there is a combination of the decreasing religious center of our country and the increasing attitude towards what work is and what work should be that we're beginning to see some really different takes and perspectives on work. With each passing generation, we have a younger and less religious one to take its place. If you're in your 20s, then you were born somewhere between 1993 and 2003. Now, I want you to know, we have multiple ministerial staff members who were born between 1993 and 2003. Take a deep breath. It's going to be okay. But in their life, things are very different than your life may have been. If you're in your 30s, you were born between 83 and 93. If you're in your 40s, you were born between 70, uh, 73 and 83. And why do I mention this? Because there is a thing happening in our country that's just not talked about enough when it comes to religion and its place in our country and the impact it's having in our own individual lives. You see, the 80s, the 90s, and the 2000s were less religious. 
So the people in the workforce now in their 20s and 30s and 40s are significantly less religious than those generations who came before them. I am not in any way saying that it was better before the 80s. We had lots of sin in our country. It's impossible to consider us ever having been completely grounded morally with the civil rights movement, the women's suffrage movement. You see, I get that we're all people of our times, but at every time in our country, we have some evidence of the sinfulness of humanity at play, and we're at a place now where it seems to be everywhere. We have a moral center that has left. What I mean by that is we have shifted from a country that was, for the most part, grounded socially on the idea of an ethic or a morality, and that has been replaced by now the opinions of the majority. And that's a new place for us. There used to be some idea of some kind of objective truth or morality that would anchor our culture, but now we've shifted the anchor from something objective to something subjective in the minds and the hearts of people. Our country's lost its religious, moral, and ethical center, and now there's so many different aspects to our culture that are vying for the center. That's why I bring this up. You see, the absence of the religious center to our country means something else is taking its place. Something else will always take the place of what once used to be at the middle or set the tone for a people or for a country. Politics is angling for the center to provide meaning and value and identity. But for most people in our country, especially the most driven and educated work and the place you work and the people you work with is presenting itself as a contender to take the place of religion in your life. You see, the reason that politics and work are contenders in this kind of space It comes down to identity and fulfillment. How do we know who we are? How do we find satisfaction and fulfillment in this world? As many are beginning to admit, these two things cannot suffice. In an uh, an Atlantic article uh, entitled, Workism is Making Americans Miserable, Derek Thompson writes, for the college-educated elite, work has morphed into a religious identity, promising transcendence and community, but failing to deliver. Now, that's a a non-Christian's perspective, writing about our country from, uh, and about how we are doing life now. Those of you who are in your 20s and your 30s and your 40s, without knowing it, you were raised at a loss of center. Like there was no religious moral center to the world that you grew up in. And so you've moved into workplaces and you're finding yourself looking for significance and fulfillment in the job title or the job category. And you're looking at for the people around you. Meanwhile, the older generation is looking at you and going, why are you like this? Like if you work somewhere where there is an Xbox room in the workplace, That makes no sense to people over the age of 45. You do that at home. You do that with your friends, with your family, but not at work. Why do we need play spaces at work? Why do we need massive gathering areas with tables and kitchens and snacks and places to just sit and visit in the workplace? Because it has become what this place used to be. It has become the place where we find our identity. It has become the place where we're trying to find some sense of significance or meaning. But even the non-Christians around us say it is failing to deliver. I find myself thankful that Solomon was not in a culture where he could write about politics because then I have to preach on it more often. But there are lots of passages in Ecclesiastes alone that we can use to apply to work and how work fits into the kingdom of God. Look with me in Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verses 18 through 21. We see several passages here that address the, the blessings and the curses and the place and the significance or the lack of significance when it comes to work. And all of this as we move, I hope all of this at the end makes sense. I don't know that I've ever written more in the process of preparing for a sermon than this one. Um, That may seem weird to you, but I I believe firmly that this is at the root of many struggles in our country and even in the church. Uh, Solomon says in Ecclesiastes 2, I hated all my toil in which I toil under the sun, 
seeing that I must leave it to the man who will come after me. And who knows whether he will be wise or a fool. Yet he will be master of all for which I toiled and used my wisdom under the sun. This also is vanity. So I turned about and gave my heart up to despair over all the toil of my labors under the sun. Because sometimes a person who has toiled with wisdom and knowledge and skill must leave everything to be enjoyed by someone who did not toil for it. This also is vanity and a great evil. That paragraph right there sums up a significant part of my relationship with people over the age of 60. That is the sentiment that many in our country are living with because they look around and go, this is not what I worked so hard for. This is not what we went to war for. This is not what we saved for. This is not what we worked overtime for. Wasn't so that this generation could squander and move the country in the direction that it's going. That is what I hear on a regular basis. And I agree. It isn't what you worked for. But you're experiencing what Solomon says he sees happening. You do all of this and you hand it to someone who has no appreciation for it because they didn't work for it. And then they don't do with it even what you hoped they would do with it. He continues in verse 22 and says, What has a man from all the toil and striving of heart with which he toils beneath the sun? For all his days are full of sorrow and his work is a vexation. Even in the night his heart does not rest. This also is vanity. There's nothing better for a person. Then that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. This also I saw is from the hand of God, for apart from him, who can eat or who can have enjoyment? For to the one who pleases him, God has given wisdom and knowledge and joy, but to the sinner, he has given the busyness of gathering and collecting, only to give to the one who pleases God. This also is a vanity and a striving after the wind. That here Solomon points out, hey, listen, this is how it works. There's a depression in the sense that work can't give you everything that you need. So take a step back and enjoy what God has given you and recognize that there is no other way to enjoy even what you are eating and what you are receiving in your workplace apart from the Lord. Then flip over to chapter 3. He says in verse 9, What gain has the worker from his toil? I have seen the busyness that God has given to the children of man to be busy with, for he has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity into the man's heart, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. I perceive that there is nothing better for them than to be joyful and to do good as long as they live, also that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in all his toil. This is God's gift to man." I perceive that whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it, nor anything taken away from it. God has done it so that the people fear before him. That which is already has been, and that which is to be already has been, and God seeks what has been driven away. What do you get from your toil? And Solomon says, listen, What I have found is that God gives us everything and everything is beautiful in its time and in its place. And so work should stay in its place. Your family should have its place. Your marriage should have its place. It is a gift from the Lord that we would be able to enjoy the fruits of our labors while we are still here under the sun. And then flip over to chapter 6. In chapter 6, verse 7, Solomon says, All the toil of man is for his mouth, yet his appetite is not satisfied. There's a lot of, I think, very profound help in just that one sentence. You should be working to have enough to live on. And yet, no matter how much you have in your pantry, you are not satisfied by what you do at work. And he puts it and frames it in a perspective for us. He says, for what advantage has the wise man over the fool? And what does the poor man have who knows how to conduct himself before the living? At the end of the day, Solomon eventually will aim all of his statements to death. That you can be wise and you can be foolish and you're both going to die. That your work And your position and your your acclaim in the world around you has no bearing on the end of your life. 
that you're going to die. The foolish man will die and the wise man will die. The poor man will die and the rich man will die. He says, better is the sight of the eyes than the wandering of the appetite. This also is vanity and a striving after the wind. Whatever has come to be has already been named. And it is known what man is and that he is not able to dispute with one stronger than he. And then he points us to the Lord. Lord's in charge. This is how things are. You cannot satisfy yourself with work. And you cannot change that reality because that is how God has made it to be. He then says in verse 11, the more words, the more vanity, and what is the advantage to man? For who knows what is good for man while he lives the few days of his vain life, which he passes like a shadow? For who can tell man what will be after him under the sun? And Solomon aims us to the reality. Listen, God knows what is good for you. Like he knows what is good for every single one in this room. And work is never to be at the center of your life. And you live in a country where work is making its way to the center, where we are led more and more by the corporate CEOs of our country. They are setting policy and direction and vision They are impacting the political and the social landscape. And friends, they are impacting the moral and the ethical landscape. For we are finding who we are in the places where we work. And so from these passages and in light of the word, I wanted to share with you practically some things that I think every Christian should embrace about work. And the first is this, that finding your identity in your job makes every job a dead-end job. It just does. If you're trying to find out who you are and determine who you are with that job, even if you make it to the top, it's a dead-end job because it will not satisfy. You can't have a large enough title. You can't have a cool enough workplace to bring satisfaction to your soul. The problem with finding your identity at work is it is idolatry. It is idolatry. It is against the Ten Commandments to find your identity in the place you work and the job title you have. And when it comes to idolatry, it is a ruthless little g God that will never, ever deliver on its promises. One of the ways that people in today's culture idolize work is they make it the center of their relational lives. I've become fascinated with this because it's what I end up sitting and listening and visiting with people about. Multiple generations trying to figure out why we can't get in a room and even feel like we know one another. Uh, People who talk to me about running their businesses and what it's like to have someone who's on the back end of their career versus someone who's on the front end of their career. And I just don't know what to do. It just feels divided. It just feels difficult. And so as someone who's 45 and realizing I've got to do this unless Jesus comes back for a whole lot longer, I want to know why what's happening behind me is happening. I I want to be able to understand if I can in the workplace where I am, where we have people in their 60s and people in their early 20s as of today with Luke. I want to be able to work together. How can we make this good? And so I find myself learning so much. The modern worker is looking for a workplace to provide almost every meaningful relationship in life. So if you're older, just learn for a moment. They don't have good relationships with their parents. They don't have meaningful relationships with peers. They don't know how to do family half the time because of what they've seen in front of them. And so they go to work because they went to churches that didn't provide those things for them. Just kept them happy and active and no meaningful relationships and no discipleship and no mentoring, no significance. It was just, did you enjoy being here? And what else can we do to make you enjoy being here so that you'll come back again? never rooting them. And so they go into work and they begin to think and to feel that because I work here, these will be my friends. They even want all their friends to come to work at the same place. They have difficult relationships. They struggle in so many ways and ultimately they want work to provide a level of meaning and purpose that begins to look and feel religious. 
They want the place they work to make a difference in the world beyond the goods and services that it provides. A young professional will choose between jobs not always based on income or product being delivered, but on where that company spends its money in the nonprofit world. What are they doing with the money that I'm helping them make becomes a deciding factor for the young generation. They want to know that beyond the goods and services, that they're wielding social and political power, that they're fighting injustice, that they're benefiting the environment and contributing toward the worthy causes of the community in which that business is located. What does it sound like? Church. It's impossible, though, for the spiritual and emotional life of a person to be healthy when work is the basis of your identity. And then there's some other ways that work gets used for purpose and significance. In the modern workplace, most people are caught up in the idolatry of what many refer to as either the comfort culture or the hustle ideology. And so by comfort culture, here's what I mean. I mean working so you can play. That work has a higher place than it should because work is the means to the self-indulgence that you're seeking. I got to go to work. I got to go to work. I got to make a bunch of money. Got to have the house I want, the toys I want, the things I want. So as soon as I'm off of work, I can go self-indulge. It's different than what Solomon's talking about. So I'm like, hey, you need to enjoy. God is good. There's joy to be had in this life. But there are many in the modern workplace who view work as the means to the culture of comfort that they want. So they can go home and binge Netflix, play online games, play Candy Crush, scroll through Instagram, play fantasy sports, shop like crazy on Amazon, search out foodie culture, and have all the comfy couch consolations to give themselves meaning. They are finding their identity in this idea of comfort culture. And then there's the hustle and grind ideology. Not just simply hardworking lifestyles. At first glance, everybody thinks what's wrong with both having some comforts and hustling. Well, when you find your identity in it, it becomes idolatry. And the hustle and grind is an ideology that pursues a future version of yourself, a tougher, a harder, a more successful, a more complete person through the relentless pursuit of self-improvement. It's when you think that you will be a better person when you get a promotion. It's when you begin to believe that I am more valuable as a person because my job title has changed, and it's idolatry. If you doubt that that is prevalent, I would ask you to consider, I would not tell you to go listen, just consider this fact about Joe Rogan. He has over 13 million subscribers to just a podcast. In a country of less than 340 million people, 13 million listen to him every single day. And his show is almost predominantly about improving yourself, being a hardworking, earning more, being more as a hustle and grind man. You see, the idea is that you win. And so much of that seems to be connected to an old philosopher by the name of Friedrich Nietzsche, who believed in what he wrote in German as the Uberman. The man that won, the man who was better than all the other men, and every culture that Nietzsche has influenced has eventually become socialist. He was at the root of Hitler. He was at the root of what became the Soviet Union. He is at the root of what is happening in the hearts and minds of so many because they believe that by being on top, they will then have value, and it doesn't matter what happens to those under them because they should have worked harder. You see, your life's identity isn't found in what you do or how much you make, but in how you do it and what you make much of. That's the Christian perspective. It's not that we would find our identity in our job titles or in our workplaces or all of our needs in the people we work around, but instead it's found in how we do it and what you make much of. Which leads me to the second point this morning, which is who you work for is more important than what you do. And I I don't mean who you work for in terms of your earthly boss. 
Working for yourself will be unfulfilling. Working for your children, according to Solomon, is unpredictable. If you work to hand everything over to them. Solomon says, you have no control. You have no idea how they're actually going to handle all that you have worked hard to give them. Working without enjoying the time and the people around you, Solomon teaches us, is depressing. And Solomon points out multiple times in his letter that if you're working to gain wealth and pass things on to the next generation, you're working for something that isn't guaranteed and can actually become discouraging. Sebastian Traeger wrote a book called The Gospel at Work. And in it he writes and says, you work for the king and that changes everything. No matter what you do, your job has inherent purpose and meaning because you are doing it ultimately for the king. Who you work for is more important than what you do. That as a Christian, who you're working for, who you're living for, is way more important than what you do. Solomon makes it clear that at the end, you're working for may not actually even happen. You can't guarantee what comes behind you. You may work and never enjoy it. You may work and your children waste it. You may work and the next guy who runs a company may completely change its direction or sell it all off for personal profit. It's clear that working to have more will never be a sufficient goal for anyone, much less Christians. And then we have to recognize that God gives us our jobs. Like you are in a job for a purpose and there's a twofold purpose for that job in your life. One, God plans to use you there. And two, God plans to grow you there. There's also the reality that is how he provides for your family and for your needs. It's how he gives you what you need to be able to go to the grocery store and put gas in the car and to buy the clothes that you need. But he has two purposes that are often neglected. He has put you there to use you there, and he has also put you there to grow you there. All those people at work that drive you crazy, all those millennials that are always on their phones and always trying to automate something and always trying to move it to the computer and move it to an iPad and can't just sit down and write something down and fill out the slip and put it in the box. I know. I live right in between both. I got a little of both. I know. They're in your life for God to use you in their life and they're in your life for God to use them in yours. And you may not have known how many rough edges you had. But you're finding out. Our jobs are more than just a means to an end. Sebastian Traeger says, whether that end is selfish enjoyment or service in the church, our work is more than something we slog through. However menial, however boring, however unmatched to our interest, our jobs are one of the key ways in which God matures us as Christians and brings glory to himself. God has a purpose for our work. It's not for your identity. And he intends for the work that we do to be done for a person, for our king, and for Jesus. My third thing this morning is that freedom to live is found in the grace of God. Like the freedom you want, the things you're hoping work will provide for you, it's found in the grace of God. Solomon points out multiple times that we are to enjoy the life we have been given, and that includes work. I yearn for the days. As a pastor, you just read and the, the days in our country's history where a coal miner could be a leader in the church. Do you know how hard it is to find a church in America where somebody working for minimum wage is a Sunday school teacher? It's not because they can't teach Sunday school. It's not because they don't have the capacity to study and to read and to make a difference in people's lives. The reason most churches don't have minimum wage people in leadership positions is because we don't think they have earned the opportunity. That is how impacted we are. You know a church has put Jesus at the center when what you make outside the building has no impact on who you are inside the body of Christ. Freedom is found when we no longer measure by the world's ways of success. But instead we learn to enjoy everything, even the job you have, it's okay. 
It's okay to not be the highest earning person in your family. It's okay to not be the highest earning person in our city. Tim Keller in his book, Every Good Endeavor, said this, your professional status is a result of grace. Think about it. Your professional status is a result of grace. All the other things in your work life, your influence, all those things, your resume, the benefit they bring you, become just things. When you embrace that where you are is by the gift of God's grace to you, you are crazy if you think you're the only person who can do what you do. You are crazy. I talked to one of the other final candidates for Harrisburg this past week as pastor from when, from my, when we were going through that process. Never talked before. Happened to find his little packet in my office when I was getting here. Found all the other ones. I was like, oh my goodness. Everybody else must have said no because these men are incredible. And I talked with a gentleman. We have a common friend. We have a common mission endeavor even between our two churches with the church he pastors and a relationship we have with a young man in New Orleans. And I listened to him, and I thought, oh, my goodness. He is so better at what he is doing than I am at what I'm doing. And I find that to be the case most of the time. And so you have lost your mind if you think that you literally just outworked everybody. There was somebody else working just as hard and probably doing just as well. And it is by the grace of God that you are where you are. And that's one of the things Solomon is trying to get us to see, is to see that God gave you this. Don't make it your religion. Don't make it your idol. It's okay to enjoy it. All the things, when you let them be what they are, you can lose them. You can lose your job. You can lose your title. You can lose all the stuff of the world, including your position in the world around you, and still be okay. That's when you know you're free and living by the grace of God. He said, our fulfillment depends upon the Lord. Solomon said in Ecclesiastes chapter 2, there is nothing better for a person than that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. This also I saw is from the hand of God. For apart from him, who can eat or who can have enjoyment? And it is wrong for us to think that we have earned our life. It is wrong It is wrong for us to believe that we are where we are because we have earned it. Now I know I'm flying all over the American dream. And the same thing's true for the whole country. We are crazy if we don't think we have had what we've had in this country because of the grace of God. People have given their lives to it, but there are people in other countries that die in wars and they don't win. There are other people sacrificing in other countries They haven't had what we've had for the last few hundred years. You see, once we recognize that where we are and what we're experiencing and what we have is all from the Lord, then we are able to truly live. And as Americans, we have kept work out of the conversation, and it's killing us. God gives it to you. It is good and it is right to enjoy the family he has given you, the people he has given you, the things that he has given you. As he says in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, he has made everything beautiful in its time. Friend, everything has its place. Solomon discusses work with a sense of disgust and frustration even throughout there. And one of that is because it is so closely related to the pursuit of wealth. And the pursuit of wealth and the pursuit of pleasure are never enough to satisfy. The pursuit of work is never enough to satisfy. All of these things will leave us wanting. And he wants us to find it in the Lord. So I want to give you three takeaways this morning before we dismiss. Trying to figure out what to cut real quick. First one is this. Live and work according to your identity in Christ. You have to live and work. See, as Americans, we've kind of put living and working as two different places, but they're not. It's the same. We find in Scripture, 1 Corinthians 6, 20 says, you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. Galatians 2, 20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You have been freed 
from the bondage of finding your identity in what your hands can produce, and that includes your job. It's great if people reward you for your hard work. It's great if your paycheck goes up. It's great if your title is bigger than it used to be. But friend, it is not where we find who we are. It is not where we find our identity. We find our identity in Christ, the one who loved us and gave himself for us. So be gospel-centered in your work. Be gospel-centered. Like in the place where you work, be there because God put you there. Colossians 3.17 says, And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. It was maybe 15 or 18 years ago, and I heard a sermon at a college conference where the preacher talked about making jeans for the glory of God. He tried to think of something that would not be very impressive. Stitching and making designer jeans. And doing that for the glory of God and learning to see even the most menial and tedious of jobs as something that we do for the Lord. And all throughout the Bible, we find that we are where God has us for a reason so that we can live for him, so we can work for him. You have to see where you work as a place God has purposed for you to be. The relationships and the opportunities are for the sake of his glory and the good that God has for you will be found when you carry out his purpose for you in life and in work. Like Esther In the Old Testament, you are where you are for a reason. You have to embrace that purpose and live faithful to the Lord at work and the way that you think about work. Mordecai told Esther, if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise from the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish, and who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. And over and over again in Scripture, God tells us, you have a role to play. You have a purpose to play. And I love that Mordecai reminds her, hey, listen, God's going to deliver his people. Like God's going to deliver his people. If you don't do it, he'll do it from somewhere else. You can trust the Lord. Listen, God, guys, God will put somebody else in that place to do the job. The business can hire someone else to do the job. There are lots of options in today's world for people to do the job that you go do every day. You leave, there are hundreds of resumes coming. Because everybody wants the job you have. So you're there for a reason. And that reason is for the Lord. To live your life and to work as a part of a bigger picture. And be joyfully content in Christ. And with the good gifts God has given you. The Christian relationship to work should stand in stark contrast to the world around us our world is never satisfied it's constantly craving fulfillment and joy promotion after promotion company jumping from one company to the next over and over again we see people never feeling satisfied and fulfilled and we should stand in stark contrast as people who are at peace people who in today's world even have the ability to rest did you know that just resting And being content with what God has given you will serve as a witness to the world. God gave us a six-day work week with a day of rest. Six days you should work. And that day of rest for his people was a day where not only did they not work, they didn't harvest. They trusted that everything that needed to be done could go without being done for one day. And that one day was then spent together as families with the Lord and enjoying all that they had in him and from him. Oh, man, today that means we need to work hard. We need to glorify God with the work that we do. But there's a time where work must stop. There's a time in your life where you need to look up at the people and see them. You need to look up and see the Lord pull your nose out of the grind, pull your identity out of the workplace and be able to stop, to not answer the phone, to not check email, to not constantly be on and concerned. When we are content enough in Jesus Christ and with what the Lord has given us, we can pack up and go home at the end of the day and trusting that all the problems that we left there will still be there tomorrow. 
and that the grace and mercy we have for today is sufficient for today and we'll have what we need for what's waiting for us tomorrow. We're able to put the phone down. We're able to quit looking at our watch. We're able to quit checking things at work over and over again and rest because we are joyfully content. It means we also don't have the expectation that other people will be ruled by work while we are at peace. It's not an expectation for your own life. It means that you would expect others to be content and to live for things other than the job and the next deadline. You see, being joyfully content is dependent on Christ being your treasure. Matthew 6 says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So what treasure does your work life reveal? In fact, that question I think could be given in relation to the last few weeks in our sermons. What treasure does your relationship with wisdom and knowledge reveal? What treasure does your relationship with wealth and pleasure reveal? Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 2 says, Vanity of vanity, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities. All is vanity. What does man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? And Jesus said, For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? So the question I leave you with is, Who or what are you working and living Let's pray together. Lord, we are so thankful that you give us what you give us, that you put us where you put us in our families and in our neighborhoods and our city and our church and our workplaces. God, I pray that we would stand in contrast to the world because it is true that we belong to you and our contentment and our peace would be a light in a world that is constantly unfulfilled and unsatisfied and working for more. God, I pray that we can be a people who can go home at the end of the day and be home, that we can be people who can take time off and trust you with all things and trust the people around us to do their part with things. And God, that that would set us apart as the people who have contentment and who have joy and find it in something other than work, who have community and relationships and significance and meaning apart from the place they work because we find it in you and we find so much of who we are in our relationships with the people you've given us in the church. God, I pray that the answer to that question of who or what we live for, that it would be Jesus. And Lord, if it wasn't before we came in, that it would be as we leave. And we pray that in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's stand.